As defined by law, cultural heritage refers to the totality of cultural property preserved and developed through time and passed on to posterity. Cultural property refers to all products of human creativity by which a people and a nation reveal their identity. These include churches, mosques, and other places of worship, schools, and natural history specimens and sites, whether public or privately owned, movable or immovable, and tangible or intangible. In this series of lectures, esteemed educators from our national university lend pertinent discussions, thus open academic discourses on Philippine cultural heritage relating to their respective fields of discipline and expertise. These can and may be used as resource materials for further learning and study. Multi-awarded and well-respected archaeologist and professor Mandy Mejares points out that archaeology and cultural heritage cannot be decoupled from each other. Archaeologists must be concerned with the preservation and protection of our cultural heritage. Okay, today our lecture will be on archaeology and cultural heritage. First, we find what is archaeology. Archaeology is a of past life ways. So focus on materials that have been remained by past civilizations and understand and reconstruct uh, their life ways. While the heritage, as uh, defined by Tikkumos, is an expression of ways and living developed by the human and passed on the next generation, including customs, practices, most of our, our cultural, our cultural uh, behavior. When we talk about future heritage, they must be uh, think about large scale monuments, such as, for example, in, in uh, Europe, you have the Stonehenge, one of the famous sites in, in England, and of course, in Asia, our biggest monument, in some case, would be the Angkor Wat. So, when people think of cultural heritage, always think of this grand scale. Unfortunately, we don't have any really large ancient monuments in the Philippines, and we would have to rely on something else be able to understand our cultural heritage. Most archaeologists would focus on the artifacts per se, cultural remains, instead of the monuments, like example, stone tools, batteries in different designs, and the bits or glass bits, uh, metal implements. So these are the artifacts that are focused on the archaeologists, no longer the, the bigger monumental structure that most they can't have. For me, when you talk about archaeology and cultural heritage, it's just not talking about the, the artifacts, but that's to be concerned also with the site. The site is the matrix and the context of these cultural materials. Without understanding them, basically the artifacts would just be beautiful materials. So most archaeologists focusing on artifacts devoid of the matrix would have just been describing it without really being understand the cultural past. The number of sites as in Philippines, for example, the open sites, which are large scale habitation sites. The one up there is Bu. Uh, the one down there would be Bora Pampanga. We also have cave sites, for which I primarily work on. Cave sites would depict the different types of archaeological excavations. And of course, we also have underwater archaeological sites, uh, especially wreck sites uh, that we be able to recover mostly historical materials. Uh, Take a sample of the site that we excavated in 1995 in Batanes, in Coast Island. We were excavating these uh, bones, bone chip burials. The focus always been the burial and the bone shape as heritage. 
And of course, it's also grand. No? You can see this nice boat shape excavated. You see this, this uh, human remains were under it. But if you only look at the boat shape and the burial, without this surrounding environment, we're losing a lot. For example, this uh, same uh, artist rendering of World Farm is the stair, the background, you see the boat shapes. But the boat shapes has to be connected with the Nagbahayans, the old structures, the jams. So both has to be understood as correct each other. Other than looking at the boat per se, you have to look at also in the environment and its uh, uh, social cultural context. In order for us to understand the past, the context of Western we need to understand and for the research on the matrix, salt sediments. So we do a lot now of not just understanding the artifacts, we understand the soil, the soil structure, uh, using soil microphology, using chemical analysis, to understand how things are being deposited. And in doing so, we may be able to reconstruct the history of how the artifact was buried, what transformed after the burying, and what transformed after the burial. For example, in excavating soil sediment, we are now recovering a lot of charcoals. Charcoals are not just simple charcoals. If you look at the microscope, they could be they could represent different types of plants. For example, these are parenchyma. Parenchyma is basically the skin of a, a root crop. When it burns, it preserves well. And it can be subjected to a number of analysis, like samples scattered in the microscope, approximately, where in we see the details of the plant structure, and with that, you can identify whether it's parenchyma or wood. So it's not just simply collecting charcoal for dating anymore, it's collecting charcoal for identifying the plant's remains in the past. Here's an interesting story where you find an, an biological sample associated with the uh, future remains. These eyes are Bomella pantanifolia or, or rami. Rami or wild ramis are used for its fiber. Uh, it's more than the other part. It's called the white rami. It's being used again as fiber for different types of weaving. So you can see at the background there, these are basically the seeds that we able to recover archaeologically. And you have the, uh, the fiber that was derived from the stand. So you have the biological material and we have the artifact used to spin thick fiber. It's one of these rare opportunities where you have the correlation between the, the plant and the artifacts. So spinner walls like this are used to spin it before weaving. And these are samples that are dated to about at least 3,000 years ago. We also collect a lot of uh, what we call micro animals. Such as phytonids, or example, Boracea or breadfruit. You have the sample for Ostivera, uh, coconut. So we know from this plant remain that they were actually using these plants uh, 3,000 ago. The different types of grass, bamboo, and Cypressea. Cypressea type of grass that grows uh, along the riverbanks. So we know that they're collecting. Uh, grass, a little bit back, and probably using that as mats or baskets. So we'll see, we'll think that, okay, organics don't survive, but there are remains that can be used to identify the bad remains. This is kind of okay, no? one of my main archaeological site. It's a very interesting place. It's okay, one of the biggest cave sites in, in the formation. It's located in the north of the zone. And it's along the Palo Lands Formation, where we identified hundreds of cave sites. And most of them are not yet even excavated. We were only excavated around 12 cave sites in this area. But it's also the home of the Calo Man. A uh, 67,000 year old fossil discovered in 2007. During the excavations, as you can see in this map, uh, there were a lot of massive museum excavations in the 70s and 80s. That is where the night the mass excavation started in 2003 until 2015. It's always been a problem in how the artifacts 
the bones were being uh, deposited. Most of my colleagues will think that this big black layer of, of black coal is actually the, was the former ceiling that collapsed. If we take that uh, view, the mouth of the cave is farther south of what's now the cave. But during my, my excavations, it seems that there must be something wrong with the interpretations. Because when we excavated just in front of the area, we're not able to cover any fossils. So what's wrong with the interpretation? The problem is it's not actually part of the, the falling ceiling, but actually it's a falling wall. So the wall collapsed around three thousand years ago. And during the time of the cave being used, there was actually no entrance. The only way to end the cave is via the sinkhole. And you can see if you'll be able to see the form is circular, meaning a additional structure of a sinkhole. If you do that, what it? Clearly see it's sinkhole. So when they, this 70 years old Kukhamenei was working around this area, he or she did not enter via the current uh, mouth, but via the sinkhole that looked down before we be able to access the, the current anti chamber key. In understanding that, then we have to shift now how are things being deposited. Looking at the different types of uh, rock formations we have excavated since 1919, in 2003, you can see that most of the caves, rock formations, are deep in uh, south uh, west. So, my understanding, now, my construction is that uh, during the time when this creature was living in this area, they were actually this Mother River across, where this, the bones were being washed wash in from the outside of the cave, into the cave, via this Mother River. Understanding that, then we will not be able to pick where most of the fossil would be, and there will be mostly along the side of the wall, the east wall. So, without understanding soil, soil, soil uh, sedimentation, the structure, the context of the artifacts, it would be more difficult to pass to really pinpoint where to locate our excavation sites. So, with that uh, understanding, we will be able to understand different depths of history uh, of the usage. Now, now we know that the bones was washed in, that this, this person did not like inside the cave, but did like outside the cave, but the bones were just washed in by the pile of the earth. This is the cave site. And the main uh, agent for the position is what the water base. You are the main remote to the bottom channel to the eastern cave. Is the wall of the cave. In the palm channel, in this side of the chamber, the break up, form that break sheet and formation, preserving all this fossil. Archaeology and cultural heritage should not really be separated, one with the other. And, and for me, if you're an archaeologist, one has to be concerned uh, for the protection and preservation of all these heritage sites. Uh, it would be unethical for an archaeologist to just excavate and leave the site without any protection or any form of uh, safeguarding that the area is safe. I think we should be consciously have this cost effort towards uh, seeing the site as part of the whole uh, narrative of heritage or in the artifacts, the void of the site is meaningless. But the problem is most archaeologists are just focuses on the, the artifacts per se. And most often than not, the sites are not are, are forgotten. And sometimes even subjected to elemental destruction or the worst human destruction as a shanty. When I was asking the Kalo K in 2007, uh, we need to be able to protect the site, yet make it be Make it be part of that uh, learning process when people can come in into the cave. So what we did is basically we did a shoring of the wall to make sure that the walls won't collapse. We put uh, narrative parts as explanations for tourists coming into the cave 
but then you'll be able to be educated. Yeah, you can place a number of, of artifacts along the wall so that when, when people come in the cave, they can be able to see what art type artifacts would be covered in the site. The problem is when I left the site, I thought the management of the cave would be able to protect it. What happened is that they removed all the types and then they created a long big type that basically concealed the whole excavation area. So people won't be able to see what's inside and they will, they will only be reading what's outside. Once this has just been done, what happens is that the inside, the excavation pit becomes a big garbage pit. People are throwing their the, the stuff there. So it's no longer interactive as a special plan. So the plan is it, it will be like a site museum, so it will be part and partial of that narrative. But when people don't have yet the proof test that the site per se is also as important as the artifacts, then we tend to forget uh, the sites. In 2015, when I went back and excavated the Kalo uh, Kalo Cave, again I had to excavate uh, deeper, wider, and even going beyond the fence area. Uh, I will destroy, destroy, I'll destroy part of the pathways. But that's, that's not important. The point is that once you stop excavating, you go to the next stage of post excavation conservation. So, what we did was we again created a structure, put on those the sacks, so sediments, and before we left, uh, as if nothing happened. So, for me, that's how you preserve sites. You need to be able to really, it's very expensive. Uh, but one has to invest. If you have money to excavate, you have to have money to preserve. And and if you don't, if you only have one half of it, then why, why excavate? Uh, it's nice to have all those artifacts being brought in to the museums. When you enter the museum, you see them, all those dioramas. But the problem is, it's devoid already of this proper context. For me, the site per se is part of the heritage that once we leave the site, we also we also be able to develop it so that the people, the barangay people, normal people there, can be able to appreciate their heritage. If you if you remove the artifact out in the museum, there's nothing there anymore for the for the local people to appreciate. Without that, they won't want, they won't be educated and they will not be protecting the site. The only way to protect the site is to get them involved in the protection. But this has to be done. We're in the we able to see that there is a proper way to preserve, a proper way to present heritage based on the local situation, based on the local environment. That's why for me, our goal is to preserve heritage to promote the artifact and the site preservation. I'm Dr. Armand Sebador Mijares, UP Adolescence Program. Thank you.